Hi guys, today we're going to talk about one of the most tricky topics in cycling and that is the benefits of the oval or non-round chain ring. This is hugely misunderstood and there's lots of misinformation out there on the internet. I'm going to give you a quick heads up using the science and the evidence, not just hearsay and conjecture. So let's start. What are we talking about when we're talking about an oval chain ring? Well, this is the classic rotor Q ring. And by the way, I'm not attached to any manufacturer, so please don't think I'm biased to any particular manufacturer or company. So the rotor Q ring has um, a degree of non-roundness, which we could class as about 10%. In everyday terms, it's been squished about its axis, about 10%, which means that in the most powerful position, if you take the chain ring pin, pin under the crank, when you're pressing down on the crank, that's your most powerful position, you've got a mechanical advantage by the extra height of the chain ring, which is about 5% more than the standard number of teeth, which is on here, it's a 54. So you get a mechanical advantage of about a 56 inch chain ring, let's say. And on the upstroke, which is relatively weak, then you get a mechanical advantage in terms of increased crank speed and reduced gearing by about two teeth. So you're going from a 54 to a 52, let's say. However, there are different chain sets available and Rotor do the QXL, which has got a 20% ovality. And you've also got Ogival on the market, which has 40% ovality. In fact, Rotor has a symmetrical oval which means you could put it on 180 degrees out of sync and it would still be perfectly okay. Certain manufacturers like Osymmetric, invented by Tallo, he invented a asymmetrical shape, which has a bicam design, which essentially means you're meant to put it on the right orientation. In theory, an asymmetric design could take into account differences in power between your left and right leg. In fact, Rotor have invented a system in power whereby you can um, measure your power using the rotor crank arm, which measures more than once a second. And then rather like what bike, it will give you your power printout for the whole 360 degree circle. Incidentally, remember the what bike recommendations that for the beginner, they're cycling in a figure of eight and in and a medium user, they're cycling as a peanut and as a advanced user, they're cycling as a sausage shape. In other words, what bike are saying you need to pedal in circles with equal force. To be honest, that is pretty much nonsense from a biomechanical point of view. If you look at the biomechanics of how you cycle around that 360 degree circle, during the downstroke, you're using very large muscles. Basically, the hip extensors, the knee extensors, so for example, the gluteus maximus, bicep femoris, and in the upstroke, you're using very small muscles like tibialis anterior. So it's been shown with EMG studies where they actually measure the muscle power that during the downstroke, the cyclist is, is essentially got 80% of their power during that downstroke. And during the upstroke, they're only, you're only, you've only got about 15% of your power. And given you've got to lift your leg up, okay, I, I realize the other crank is pressing down, but you still have to lift the leg up to get it up to that upstroke. That 15% power could translate into no real mechanical force operating on the bike during that upstroke. In fact, using very accurate power meters, we can measure the amount of torque at every point in that 360 degree circle. And it turns out that in the downstroke, when you've got maximum power, you might have 40 nanometers of torque. But in the upstroke, you typically have maybe five nanometers of torque. So in theory, if you wanted to adjust your gearing by squishing the, the um, chain ring to match that biomechanical efficiency, you would, in theory, have to have a 53 on the downstroke and a eight tooth chain ring equivalent on the upstroke to make an 85%, 15% split, which basically doesn't exist. However, in real life, things are more complicated than that. Of course, I realize that because in that 360 degree circle, you're pedaling down on the other side. So essentially, from a biomechanical point of view, the 360 degree circle is split into a half circle. Now, does that mean then that the pedal velocity is changing on the way down. We know the force is increased on the downstroke. Is the pedal velocity faster on the downstroke? Well, yeah, of course it is. The pedal velocity is faster on the downstroke and slower on the upstroke, but not as much as you would think. In fact, it's been measured now and the pedal velocity increases only about 2% faster on that downstroke and 2% slower in the upstroke. In real life, how does that translate into the chain speed and then the bike speed? Okay, well, we'll think about it like this. It takes about 0.8 of a second or 8 tenths of a second to complete one revolution with one leg. Only 8 tenths of a second pedaling at 75 RPM. So that, mean, that means it takes 4 tenths of a second to do the downstroke. And then I said it's about 2% faster 
during the downstroke, your pedal speed or your pedal velocity because of your increased muscle power. So that means 2% faster of 4 tenths of a second. That's around 1 hundredth of a second. So it's only taking 1 hundredth of a second less to do the downstroke and 100 and and a hundredth of a second slower to do the upstroke, which means the chain is moving a hundredth of a second faster in the downstroke and a hundredth of a second slower during the upstroke. You can see it's an extremely subtle difference. And it's a very subtle difference that oval versus round chain rings are trying to accomplish here. Does that translate into bike speed, however? Well, it doesn't really translate into bike speed by the same token, for the reason that when you're going along on the flat, or definitely when you're going along downhill, then your bike is subject to a lot of momentum. The momentum comes from the weight of the frame, the rider, and the wheels. That translates into the real world that when you're pressing harder on the pedals, it takes time for the bike to accelerate. You don't get much instantaneous acceleration, deceleration of pedaling around you know, one rotation of the crank. It does exist, and in fact, I thank Alex Simmons on his blog for showing that even on the flat, the bike accelerates about 0.2% of the speed during the downstroke and decelerates about 0.2% of the speed during the upstroke. Effectively, it's negligible, and most cyclists won't notice that going along on the flat. However, if you change the parameters and you have a very heavy rider cycling uphill at a slow speed, particularly standing rather than sitting where the power is amplified during the downstroke, yes, then you'll get a pulsing effect, and that pulsing effect could be 2 to 4%. And probably that's what cyclists meant by that dead spot. You know this whole thing about round and non-round chain rings is often designed to d reduce that dead spot. But actually, when you think about it, we don't even know what we mean when we talk about the dead spot. Yes, this return power on the upward lift is lower during the return to base position. In other words, when you get past that 180 degree position, that return to base position of the crank is, of course, much weaker. But as we said, that's not necessarily translated into a big difference in pedal speed velocity return. And it's not really translated into a big difference in terms of cycling speed itself. And there isn't really a huge difference in perceived effort during that return part of the leg. And the reason for that is adaptation. It's amazing what cyclists can adapt to. All sorts of crazy bikes, crazy gears, cra uh, crazy configurations. Your body can adapt. So if you're a cyclist that's done many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of crank rotations with round chain rings, then you'll be fully adapted to round chain rings. If you've done the same with oval chain rings, you'll be fully adapted to oval chain rings. It's only when you change from one to the other do you notice a difference. So then the question we're really addressing today is what is the effect of transferring from a round to an oval chain ring? Well, sure, when you've got an oval chain ring, and it's correctly orientated, then on the downstroke, you are getting a mechanical advantage of an increased gearing. And on the upstroke, you're having a mechanical disadvantage, but in effect, a mechanical advantage, given that you're relatively weaker, of reducing your gearing on the upstroke, which also translates into a fractionally quicker return of the pedal to that upward position. And when I say fractionally quicker, I mean around about a hundredth of a second quicker, not a tenth of a second or a quarter of a second. No, that would be crazy. So I guess the question is then, does that mechanical advantage of having that oval system produce extra power? Well, there's a big caveat here that if you take crank-based power meters, they measure crank power by averaging out the uh, torque at various points times the velocity or rotational speed of the crank. In other words, the complex calculation that crank-based power meters take into account can actually be put off, apparently, by oval cranks. And it's said that they can be out by 1, 2, or 3 percent. So this probably means that in most studies where they've used crank-based power meters, it's not really valid. You need a pedal-based power meter or a hub-based power meter in order to measure the difference of oval chain rings. So you need a pedal-based power meter or, or a hub-based power meter in order to really measure the difference. And whilst we're on measuring the differences, nearly all the studies out there are flawed, unfortunately. Now, the reason I say this is because most have been sponsored by a manufacturer, which is going to probably produce an inherent bias. Most haven't been randomized. Most have not been used cyclists, which are blind to the types of cranks they're using. So they've covered the cranks during the test procedure. Most haven't had an adequate sample size. haven't do, compared um, chain sets of different degrees of ovality, so you can see whether there's a coherent effect. And finally, they haven't compared against 
round chain rings which have accounted for the difference in gearing. Let me tell you what I'm talking about there. I'll show you one study here that has actually ticked most of those boxes. And what that one study found is that when using the non-round oval chain rings, that there was a slight increase in power and efficiency in that downward part of the motion that the meant that the oval chain ring had the mechanical advantage. But there was actually a decrease in power, i.e. reduced efficiency, in the upward, upward return leg. So in that 360 degree circle, the oval chain ring did have a mechanical advantage in the downstroke, but it had a mechanical disadvantage in the upstroke. Okay, hang on a second. So if I get a, a chain ring that has an increased number of teeth on the downstroke, but has an increased equal number of teeth on the upstroke, I'm going to get a mechanical advantage on the downstroke and a mechanical advantage on the upstroke, aren't I? Hang on, I've just invented the round chain ring. Okay, how can that, how can that make any sense? Right, well look, the reason this whole debate might exist is because if you compare users of oval chain rings with round chain rings, I can guarantee those users of oval chain rings have changed the chain ring on their bike. They've looked at the number of teeth, they've chosen one that suits them. They've at least thought about what chain ring is best suited for their gearing. And that could be the key thing. Maybe it's not about round or non-round chain rings. Maybe it's about finding the right chain ring for you. Maybe the thing is to find the correct number of teeth that suits your riding. Maybe the correct thing is to find a round chain ring that suits your riding with the correct teeth or an oval chain ring. Hey, yeah, if there are differences, if you personally find that there's an oval chain ring that looks good and that gives you a perceived mechanical advantage or one that you feel is more efficient, that's great, use it. But for everyone else, have a think about the number of teeth on your chain ring. Have a think about what is the best chain ring for you. Don't necessarily assume what everyone else is doing is going to suit you. Do what is best for your riding. That's my take-home message. And that's enough on overall chain rings. Take care, guys.